John Muir, who grew up amid the prairie flowers in Columbia County, foresaw their impending disappearance from the Wisconsin landscape. In about 1865, he offered to buy from his brother a small part of the meadow of the family homestead, to be fenced and set aside as a floral sanctuary or reservation. His offer was refused. I imagine that his brother feared not so much the loss of a few square rods of pasture as he feared the ridicule of his neighbors. By 1965, when the rare prairie flowers are gone, the cultural descendants of John Muir's brother may look at a picture of the legendary white-fringed orcas and wish they could see one. After the 80-acre piece of prairie was lost to farming, Professor Leopold was successful in saving the 60 acres where the orchids had been transplanted. This first piece of prairie preserved as public land in Wisconsin was named after Mr. Favel. And my grandfather probably was a cheerleader on the sideline and his name is now uh, on it as, uh, as the namesake of the Favel Prairie Preserve. Aldo Leopold reported the events by updating his essay, Exit Orcas. On May 15, 1940, cattle were turned to pasture on the Favel Prairie, long known to botanists as one of the largest and best remnants of unplowed, ungrazed prairie sod left in the state. In it grow the white lady slipper, the white fringed orcas, the prairie clover. Within the track converted to pasture last year, the cattle demolished the prairie vegetation within a single season. If any of it was left, it was underground. By September, the grazed area looked like any other pasture. The loss of this track, however, called public attention to the question of preserving prairie vegetation. An adjacent track containing 60 acres and botanically almost as good as the lost pasture has now been purchased by Mr. and Mrs. Philip E. Miles of Madison for the express purpose of protecting its flora. Mr. and Mrs. Miles are retaining title to the land, but will allow the university botanists to use it for research purposes. That summer of 1941, Art Hawkins and Elizabeth Tillotson were married. I think the most important thing that happened here on the prairie was uh, the fact that uh, uh, my wife and I got married out on the prairie here. <laughs> uh, that was... That was 60 years ago, and, uh, and Betty is right over here, right back at Dave. And uh... <laughs> Yeah, she was married on the prairie in 1940, I think it was 41. She was married a year before I was, I think. And we all went up there, and she carried a prairie bouquet. Of course, this Alice and I discovered that the, the wedding bouquet was wilting. Uh, because it was all wildflowers. It was wonderful. Then we all went back to the farm for a chicken dinner that mother had fixed for I don't know how many people, probably 35 or more. And uh, I remember how hot it was. I remember how hot it was. So that's where she was married. The minister went up there and... The day was beautiful and the prairie really looked lovely. They were, they were of course, way ahead of their time about prairies. In 1945, the Miles family deeded the Favel Prairie to the university under the care of the Arboretum. The deed called for reasonable, reasonable and proper efforts to eliminate or prevent the coming of intrusive or exotic vegetable growth. But at the time, not much was known about how to take care of these small remnants of prairie. It's had a terrible problem of, uh, of, of uh, aspen and, other, and willow taking over. Much of it has been lost, uh, uh, not through agriculture per se, but through uh, uh, allowing uh, some of the woody plants to come in and, and, and take over. Portions of the prairie that were saved from cultivation now uh, have uh, lost a lot in quality as compared to the early years. Aldo Leopold died in 1948 and Stoughton Favel the following year at the age of 99. In 1952, the state of Wisconsin extended further protection to the Favel Prairie by naming it a state scientific area. There followed a period of benign neglect. The Arboretum periodically mowed the prairie, but did little more. 
the neighboring farms became more modern, practicing clean farming, increasing the use of chemicals and digging ditches. I might tell you a story about Faber Prairie. I was there for the first time about uh, 39 years ago. In 1957, I believe. And there was a freshly dug drainage ditch on two sides. Uh, the farmer evidently had absolutely no interest uh, in preserving that prairie. In fact, I think he was hoping the whole thing would just crash so the university would then say, oh, please, Mr. Farmer, take it off our hands. You can have it for practically free. Go plow it and plant some corn. And my students and I, uh, in a lesson in civil disobedience, we got our shoes very muddy, but we tried to push as much of the dirt back into the ditch. I don't think it did any good. In 1960, Dave Tillotson was teaching at a Milwaukee area high school and convinced the Milwaukee Audubon Society to buy a buffer strip to protect the Fayville Prairie on the north and west. We had bought a perimeter up here with, with Milwaukee Audubon, 34 acres surrounding the Fayville Prairie, and we paid $125 for the cornfield that stood there. There was a popcorn field, three acres of popcorn right on the river. And we, we got that from Mr. Zerbach and uh, Mr. Neuper. Dave's high school students scattered a few prairie seeds on the cornfield that year, but there was virtually no other maintenance done for 40 years. Plants like Prairie Dock almost immediately jumped the fence and started colonizing the buffer strip. In 40 years, the white lady slippers have migrated on their own well into the buffer area. The individual clumps are larger than those on the virgin prairie, presumably because of less competition for root space. The ones Leopold transplanted from what was going to be farmland onto university property. Now there's lady slippers both on the university property on what was farm property. The orchids also demonstrate that it's easier to restore land next to a virgin prairie than it is to establish a prairie completely surrounded by farms or suburbs likely because the microorganisms are present in the soil. In the 1970s, two field staff from the Wisconsin DNR stumbled across another small prairie remnant a mile and a half up the river. This land had been heavily mowed by the farm family who owned it, but saved from destruction because an elderly farm woman liked the prairie flocks in the springtime. After a local political struggle, a 40-acre piece was purchased by the Nature Conservancy and named the Snapper Prairie. Because of the heavy mowing, it had lost some of the diversity of the plants that the Fable remnant enjoys, but it is still home to the white-fringed prairie orchid. I think it's really critical that remnant prairies like Snapper Prairie and Fable are managed and kept as high quality as possible because these sites truly will make the restorations a lot easier because you're using a base of seed where you can get lots of seed off of hundreds of species. And the fact is the genotypes in such a prairie are without, you can't put a dollar price on these. What we're doing here today is trying to monitor the populations of rare plants and trying to do this on an annual basis to give us a feel for how the populations are doing and whether our management work of prescribed burning is impacting positively or negatively the numbers of those species. Oh, that's good to get that brush burned up. Yeah, look at it, scorch those willows. In recent years, the Fable Prairie itself is receiving the care it deserves. The University Arboretum has stepped up effective management practices, including regular burning and eradication of invasive trees. These are the aspen trees we're working on, and uh, do the, um, it looks like a 22 shell in there. Just take a little, little tool, you jab it in there, and it's herbicides, it's uh, Roundup is in there, it kills the tree. GPS, I'm uh, marking the points. You can put a point right where exactly where we're at. I'm putting points at each of the corners of the aspens. It also tracks where I've been. So I'll bring in a computer and we'll be able to bring it up on a map. Once we have it on a map, then we will know exactly how big it is. 
you know, relative, where it is relative to everything else. These small areas don't have the biological diversity for the, for the ecological processes to proceed the way they're meant to proceed because they don't have all the pollinators, they don't have all the invertebrates, they don't have all the grazing animals. Now, as far as favored prairie is concerned, if nothing ever happens to it, by and by, slowly but surely, species are going to die out. If you don't have new seeds coming in to replace those that died out, sooner or later you will have an impoverishment of the biodiversity. It can't be helped. It has to be this way. So that in a sense they are the living dead. The yellow lady slippers, as far as I know, have been here in small numbers and the deer love to eat them and there's plenty of deer down here. So it's not surprising that they're not having a good time. I will say this for Favor Prairie. It has certainly great heuristic value as a teaching instrument, as a research instrument. And we initiated a study several years ago uh, looking at ways to control the aspen, but laying upon that we wanted to know what effect on the ground layer vegetation uh, would be getting rid of the aspen, at least reducing it. So we ran these uh, transects through the existing aspen cones and along these transects we've been sampling the ground layer vegetation to see how uh, the removal of the clone has affected the vegetation. Over the years, people learned techniques of restoring prairies on land that had been farmed. Once again, many of the guiding principles could be traced to Aldo Leopold and his family project at the shack. We at first bought pine trees from the native nurse, local nursery, and every spring vacation we'd go out and uh, dig holes and put these in on a landscape plan which Dad had developed. Dad was very careful to, uh, to see to it that we were planting only plants that grew in soils that he felt were, were c compatible with that particular species. Uh, it became clear that Dad was concentrating on strictly native species and that we were uh, taught very clearly that what we were doing was restoring an old farm uh, back to what it may have been the natural uh, condition. In the late 1990s, the Madison Audubon Society purchased 50 acres adjoining Favel Prairie to the south and began a prairie restoration. What you see here, the field, that's a uh, former uh, cornfield, uh, comprises about 27 acres of the 50-acre parcel that Audubon purchased from the Tillotsons. Madison Audubon was interested in acquiring this property so that the drainage ditches on this property could be filled in in order to help to retard the draining of the water from Fable Prairie proper. And last October 14th and 15th, uh, with the cooperation of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Madison Audubon um, bulldozed in the middle ditch and the northernmost ditch. Long term, uh, we hope to be able to restore all the way down to the river. As I said, the, what we've planted is 27 acres of the 50 acres. Um, there's a lot more work to do down there, and we hope that in future years, if additional land uh, down here becomes available, that Madison Audubon will be able to acquire that land. In May of 2001, that 50-acre piece was dedicated as the Tillotson Prairie. And see there's compass plants there, but we estimate on the prairie aspect out here there's like 4,000 per acre and when you start seeing how thick they are here, there's a lot of them out here. We also have out here, our, uh, which looks similar, here's a prairie dock coming, here's a stiff goldenrod. The orchids are going to blow in, the white French prairie orchids are blowing, but we could probably, the question is maybe we should get some uh, white lady slipper seed and throw it out here. I'm one of the few people here, per perhaps, that set foot on this crawfish prairie as far back as 1934, 35, I'll take it back. Um, I came out here as a grad student to um, Aldo Leopold in 35, and one of my first assignments... Right now there's only about 8,000 acres of prairie left in the state of the several million acres that used to be out there, so it's important to protect the remnants but it's also important to provide buffers around them as well as additional habitat 
and for the rare species, we've got many species. The erosion of species seems to be higher in wet prairies. The larger the prairie remnant is, the better it is at conserving species. So one of the things that's so important here is that the effective area of that prairie is increasing. And so over the long term, we're going to have a much better opportunity of actually making this the floral preserve that it was meant to be in the first place. Portions of the buffer area that were lost to trees are being reclaimed by interns and volunteers. The same group battles invasive weeds in the restoration land and collects seeds for replanting the lost prairie. Yeah, we added a few of the early things. They're, they're looking really good. There's a lot of good stuff coming in them. The flax didn't seem to set seed this year. Snapper prairie burned late. Um, they got about two-thirds of it burned, but they did it I don't know, the third week of May or something, and so that set a lot of the early stuff back, but we should get good seed production on the later stuff. Since 2001, Madison Audubon has purchased additional parcels of land near the Favel Prairie and continues to expand restoration. Last fall we bought the green property, 140 acres, and then this spring we bought 80 acre, the 80 acre Brant parcel which goes from Wayne Magnuson's land south of Prairie Lane all the way up to G. Today, throughout the Midwest, people are planting prairies. On the Sand County land where Aldo Leopold pioneered restoration techniques, his family continues the work they began 70 years ago. The way you define a prairie, in my opinion, is t it has something to do with the total number of species that represent the prairie. And my sister Nina now, she told me yesterday, she's dealing with planting 140 different species. When we first bought it, it was corn stubble and cockleburs. There wasn't anything but a row of elms. And now we've, we have restored it, and it uh, is coming back to its natural vegetation. The habitat was all that was needed, and we began to get uh, some really important uh, wildlife showing up. Lots of um, woodcocks that were on the increase. We now even have a bear. We didn't have to reintroduce them. As long as we, we restored the, the habitat, the animals came back. For example, um, in my father's journal, he writes, I don't know why we don't have otters. And he was talking about river otters. Mm -hmm. And my husband, Charlie Bradley, wrote in his journal, 50 years later, I don't know why we have otters, but the habitat is better. All the Leopold would have been delighted to uh, think in terms of sandhill cranes nesting in this area again. I don't think he ever envisioned that at all. All we saw today out on the prairie is uh, way beyond my highest hope of ever seeing again around here. And, uh, with that kind of a change and with the cooperative spirit you saw today and among the, all the different organizations, I, it, it, certainly if you came here, your hopes would be raised. Favel Prairie was severely damaged. Last summer in June, we had unprecedented storms that dumped just large quantities of rain in the area after a really snowy, wet winter. And this part of the of Favel Prairie was under about three feet of water for three weeks. Within recorded history, we're not aware that that has ever happened. People talk about it having been a 500-year flood that. Um, came in the summertime, these uh, ecosystems down here in river floodplains have evolved to withstand flooding in the early spring when all of the plants are dormant. But with the flooding in June and then the three feet of water that sat completely covering all of the plants 
it killed a lot of plants. It set back an awfully lot. By and by, slowly but surely, species are going to die out. If you don't have new seeds coming in to replace those that died out, sooner or later you will have an impoverishment of the biodiversity. It can't be helped. Um, we're not seeing any drop seed, uh, which used to be the predominant grass in here. And we're waiting to see what will happen with the succession of uh, the, the seed bank and what, what, what will come as a result of that. We haven't seen any of the eastern prairie white fringed orchids. Uh, they probably drowned out as well. Um, we're hopeful that the seed bank will uh, allow those to come back. Uh, we looked for the small white lady slipper orchids, uh, which uh, was reported one or two plants were blooming, but we haven't seen any of those either. This area where we're standing right now yeah, used to be full of prairie dock. Um, and you can see there are a few prairie docks in here. Uh, interesting, the plants that were able to survive. You would have thought the silphiums with roots that go down so far uh, and old plants that they might have gone dormant, but I guess not. <clears throat> About a, oh, maybe half to three quarters of a mile from here on Audubon Restorations, uh, where the water uh, wasn't as deep because it's slightly higher in elevation, the tops of the leaves of the prairie docks and the compass plant were out of the water, so they weren't completely drowned out. And this year, all of those plants are thriving. There's an endangered moth called the silphium borer moth that <laughs> lays its eggs in the stems of the leaves. And uh, we were quite concerned that they were lost because of the flooding but we've uh, found those also in our restorations. It's really quite interesting to see the dynamics of this uh, native ecosystem and how it's responding to that un unprecedented flooding. We are seeing a lot more uh, sedges uh, in Fable Prairie, and we're also seeing a lot more uh, of the uh, prairie cordgrass. Walking the prairie, one feels a mixture of dismay and hope. Dismay because of the hurt ecosystem, and hope that the plants are still alive underground and will come back this year or next. One also feels gratitude for the ecological restoration work by Madison Audubon and others, work that has kept this river valley as healthy and diverse as possible.